Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's e-seminar, which is part of Agilent Technologies' Cell Analysis Webinar Series. My name is Sarah Burrows. I am the Product Manager for Seahorse XF Analyzers at Agilent, and I will be your host for this e-seminar. Before I introduce our speaker for today, allow me to share a bit about Agilent and our products for cell analysis. Agilent is a leader in life sciences, clinical research, diagnostics, and applied chemical markets. With over 14,000 employees worldwide, our company provides laboratories with instruments, services, consumables, applications, and expertise to enable our customers to gain the insights they seek. Our cell analysis solutions for energy metabolism measurements include the Seahorse XF platform for label-free high-sensitivity assays, as well as soluble metabolic sensors for a convenient plate reader workflow. Today I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Yu Ting Sung as our presenter. She is an institute research scientist and project leader at the Therapeutics Discovery Division of MD Anderson. Dr. Sun got her PhD at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, working with Dr. J. Chen, studying the mTOR pathway. She conducted her postdoc training at Genentech with Jeff Settlement, studying metabolic rewiring and drug resistance. At MD Anderson, she has been a co-leader and critical contributor to the preclinical work of multiple drug discovery programs including early-stage tumor metabolism programs involving the OxFos inhibitor A, or sorry, IACS-10759 that is currently in Phase I clinical trials. It is this latest work that Dr. Sun will share with us today. Before I hand it over to Yu Ting, a couple of housekeeping notes. There will be a question and answer period immediately following the talk. To help us get to as many of your questions as possible, we encourage you to type in your questions in the chat window during your presentation. Um, and we will get to those questions when the uh, Dr. Sun has finished. With that, I will hand over the presentation to Yu Ting. All right, uh, thank you so much, Sarah, for the nice introduction. Uh, many thanks to Agilent for giving me the opportunity to present our work at this uh, forum. And uh, hello, everyone. Um, as Sarah mentioned earlier, I work for the Therapeutics Discovery Division at University of Texas at MD Anderson Cancer Center. So this is a uh, biotech-like department that is embedded under uh, academic institute and a major cancer hospital. It's my great pleasure to share with you some of our research in uh, targeting metabolic synthetic lethality today in, for oncology setting today. So here is the outline of my presentation today. After a brief introduction, I would like to share with you two published stories. One is uh, targeting PGD in FH mutated cancer, and the other is targeting Oxfos in glycolysis deficient tumor. Through these two stories, I hope you can appreciate the uh, utilization of the Seahorse technology in uh, biotech uh, early stage R&D work. Then uh, at last, I would like to share with you some unpublished work in, uh, on developing a Seahorse assay to support phase one clinical trial uh, of our Oxfos inhibitor IX10759. So just to clarify, uh, this is for research use only. This is uh, uh, not uh, meant for uh, diagnostics uh, uh, procedures and uh, not on the clear setting and not to enable decision making for the patients. So with that, um, the altered metabolism is a key feature of the cancer cells. So an ethical review written by um, Hanahan and Bob Weinberg in uh, 2011 has included deregulating cellular energetics as a key hallmark of cancer. Uh, the rapid proliferation of cancer cells simply require more energy, like ATP and uh, micromolecules uh, to, uh, to enable that. Therefore, the cells have to um, rewire its metabolism network to meet such demands. 
because of that, that opens many potential opportunities for targeting tumor metabolism in cancer therapies. So this is a very busy slide, and um, what I, I, I hope you can appreciate is there are um, many um, chemical probes, experimental therapies, or even approved drugs out there uh, to target the tumor metabolism network. So this includes uh, anti-metabolites. Uh, these will be the mimic of the natural metabolites in, in, inside uh, human cells. An example will be uh, 5-FU, which is a mimic of uridine, and, and that is actually approved chemotherapy uh, that has been used for many years in the clinic. And there are, on this slide, we can also see uh, um, there are some uh, drugs or, 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 or chemical probes targeting glucose metabolism, the so-called Warburg effect. Um, there are approaches targeting amino acid metabolism. An example of that is the GLS inhibitor for uh, targeting glutamine metabolism. Uh, there are approaches that are targeting lipid metabolism, redox, homeostasis, and mitochondria as well. And no doubt, lots of potential therapeutic opportunities in targeting tumor metabolism. And however, this is not an easy field for therapeutics either. There are many challenges out there. And um, I, I summarize some of the, the key challenges from a biologic, bi biologic point of view. So these are actually three uh, challenges that intertwined. They are connected with each other. One is a metabolic bypass and adaptation. Uh, the metabolism network is so intrinsic to all our cells. There, it's so critical over evolution. Therefore, nature has come up with uh, mechanisms uh, to um, ensure it's working. If one pathway is fails, there is a backup mechanism. There is probably a backup of the backup mechanism as well. Therefore, when we hit one node of the metabolism, one pathway, there will almost always be bypass coming up, metabolic adaptation occurring. And the second is the therapeutic index, because uh, many of these mechanisms that occur in normal cells as well, very often we are highly relying on the, rap just the rapid uh, proliferation of cancer cells to argue for a therapeutic index. And thirdly, for many um, experimental therapies for tumor metabolism, uh, there is a lack of a clearly defined genetic context, uh, probably with the exception of IDH inhibitors. Um, most, for most of the case, we, it's not like uh, uh, EGFR inhibitor targeting EGFR mutated non small cell lung cancer or like uh, NTRAC inhibitor targeting NTRAC fusion cancer. Uh, for the tumor metabolism targets, very often we don't have that. So to overcome uh, the challenges, our hypothesis is uh, we think uh, we should target synthetically lethal interactions, basically in particular for uh, lots of function mutations of metabolic en enzymes uh, that will uh, generate additional metabolic adaptation. And therefore, by targeting such synthetic lethal interactions, hopefully we can uh, improve the therapeutic index and we can reduce metabolic adaptation as well. So the cancer genome sequencing network has, um, has uh, uh, identified oncogenes and tumor suppressors. For um, the met metabolism enzymes, there are a few uh, mostly commonly mutated enzymes uh, uh, that serve as uh, metabolic oncogenes or uh, tumor suppressors. The most commonly mutated one is um, IDH, IDH1 and IDH2. These are gain function mutations, so basically these are oncogenes. The gain function mutations on IDH will, um, uh, again, some um, epigenetic function, and that will drive uh, tumor formation. So uh, work pioneered by Agios and others, um, and, and, and most recently Agios have developed IDH inhibitors uh, uh, that are, have already been approved for IDH-mutated uh, uh, leukemia. Now, these are the metabolic oncogenes. For tumor suppressors, um, now the, the FH and SDH, these are two enzymes similar to IDH. These are in the TCA cycle. So these, two, um, these two enzymes, they actually have lots of function mutations, not again of function mutations uh, in tumor. So these lots of function mutations, these two 
um, oxphos deficiency because these are tumor suppressors. We can now directly targeting FH and H SDH. And how do we target FH mutated or SDH mutated tumors? I'd like to say a few more words about FH and SDH. FH is fumarate hydratase. Um, it occurs more often in this disease called HLRCC. This is the uh, hereditary uh, uh, myomatosis um, in the renal cell carcinoma. It's a very aggressive subtype of renal cell carcinoma. It's featured by germline mutation in FH. Then the mutation in the second copy of FH would lead to a tumor formation. And also SDH. Uh, succinate dehydrogenase, uh, this occurs uh, more uh, often in um, uh, paraganglioma, in the uh, angio gland uh, fional mycytomas, and uh, the gastrogist stoma tumors, and of course, renal cell carcinoma as well. These are very rare diseases, I have to say. Um, they tend to spread uh, with a very small uh, tumor volume, so they're very aggressive. And there are currently no effective therapies uh, targeting uh, as these type, uh, kinds of tumors. So to identify potential uh, therapeutic targets um, for um, these, um, this type of cancer, uh, we started uh, with model selection. We used a seahorse assay uh, to uh, evaluate metabolic rewiring in a panel of uh, cancer cell lines. And, and uh, you are probably pretty familiar with that. The seahorse measures uh, can measure E car and O car and also uh, uh, the, um, PPR. This is the proton production rate. So here we actually take the ratio of a PPR versus OCAR. PPR stands for the glycolysis rate, just like ECAR. And the OCAR stands for oxygen consumption. That's the uh, oxfos, oxidative phosphorylation rate. So basically, the ratio will tell us uh, the rate of glycolysis versus uh, oxidative phosphorylation. The higher the ratio, uh, the more glycolytic um, the cell line is. So through sequence analysis of this panel of selected cell lines, uh, you can clearly see there are two outliers. One is the green bar, the MB1 cells. It's, a glycoly it's clearly glycolysis deficient. There is pretty much undetectable amount of uh, proton production in this cell line. And I will talk about this cell line a little bit later. And the other cell line is uh, the line on the very right, this so-called UK262 cells. Clearly, it has a high glycolysis rate and low um, oxidative phosphorylation rate. This is actually a uh, FH mutated uh, renal cell carcinoma cell line. So this is a model we can use uh, to uh, conduct um, a, a screening for potential targets in, for the FH mutated cancer. So we conducted a, a loss of function genetic screen um, you know, you, using the UOK262 cell line. Basically, uh, you, we infected this FH mutated cell line with a pool of SHRNA uh, containing lentiviruses. This is a uh, library contains uh, SHRNA targeting about 300 uh, me metabolic genes. So the cells are infected, pure selected. Uh, 48 hours after uh, selection, the cells, um, the reference library uh, will be collected. Then the cells will continue to culture it and select it for another two to three weeks. By then, whatever SHRNAs that has a growth disadvantage will be depleted in uh, the cell line. And we also collected uh, these cells. We conducted a barcode sequencing. Basically, each SHRNA is conjugated to a barcode. Using sequencing, we de delineate the barcode, barcode and, 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 um, abundance of the experimental uh, library versus the reference library, which tells us which genes are specifically depleted uh, during uh, the culturing over uh, two to three weeks. So in the end, interestingly, in the UOK262 cells, uh, FH mutated cell line, out of the about 300 uh, metabolic genes, and the PGD um, is a, uh, clearly a top hit uh, in the UOK262 cell line. Basically, uh, genetic depletion of a PGD causes the biggest growth disadvantage in this cell line. Then this is not a uh, for miscuous hit, because uh, a few cell lines we tested, those are the FHY type cell lines, and PGD is not a hit in any of these cell lines. 
So this is data from the functional genomics screen. Then, um, then we ask ourselves, um, PGD looks interesting. What is it? What does it do? So this is uh, an enzyme in the pentose phosphate pathway. The slide here, you see the glycolysis network. We have glycolysis. Um, we have the pentose phosphate pathway. So basically, PGD sits at the uh, interface of the oxidative branch and the non-oxidative branch of the pentose phosphate pathway. So this is uh, a rate-limiting enzyme uh, in PPP. Because of the connection between PPP and the glycolysis, the PGD inhibition actually, PGD is actually critical for glycolysis. Uh, even though this is not a direct glycolysis enzyme. There are two key uh, functions of PGD. One is it generates NADPH, therefore it's critical for redox. And also PGD generates phosphate 5, uh, the, ri the ribose 5-phosphate. So this is a 5-carbon sugar. Basically, PGD converts 6-carbon sugar to 5-carbon sugar. Therefore, PGD is critical for nucleotide synthesis. So that appears to be an important enzyme uh, for the cell proliferation. To make sure our screening uh, data is valid, uh, we followed up with a, a target validation work. First, using the UOK262 cell line with FH loss of function mutation, we infected the cells with the docs inducible hairpins over PGD, and we show genetic inhibition of PGD robustly suppresses the cell proliferation. And also, you see on the Western blot on the right, that induces the robust apoptosis of the cells as well. And interestingly, this effect is context specific. When we use the isogenic cell line, when we uh, uh, um, reintroduce Y-type FH to UOK262 cell lines, um, they, well, we use the seahorse assay to confirm uh, this rescued cell line indeed has oxygen consumption restored. So then um, we knocked down PGD in the FH rescued cell line. We see a much less pronounced anti-proliferative effect with the genetic tools. And most importantly, we no longer see induction of um, apoptosis by PGD genetic inhibition. So this data uh, uh, confirms the context spe specific essentiality of PGD. In addition to that, to make sure um, that the effect we see is not due to off-target activity of the hairpins, we took two approaches. One is uh, the classical approach called genetic rescue with the SHRNA resistant cDNA. Here we overexpress um, SHPGD resistant PGD cDNA in the cells. Um, you can see on the top, on the left, overexpression of uh, control enzyme GFP that has no impact on the effect of uh, SHPGD on cell proliferation. However, the overexpression of uh, PGD uh, that completely rescues the anti proliferative effect of the SHPGD. And second, we're very, uh, we're very fortunate here. We can use a, a cell line called MB1 I mentioned earlier. This is actually a PGD homozygous deleted cell line. It does not express PGD at all. And when we introduce a docs inducible hairpins to this cell line, um, this, and there is absolutely no effect no, uh, on a cell proliferation. This is a dramatic difference from the UOK262 cell line. So these pieces of data clearly tells us the response we see is indeed due to the on-target activity of PGD. Um, for I, I, I think uh, people can pretty pr probably appreciate is uh, with a lot of uh, tumor metabolism um, targets, uh, very often we see a very robust in vitro effect. When taking that in vivo, the effect is becoming far less pronounced. So it's important to validate the target in vivo. Here we use uh, we took the UOK262 cell line uh, harboring docs inducible hairpins in vivo. We waited until the tumors are well established. They are around 300 cubic millimeter. Then we give the mice doxycycline through their food, which will induce uh, the expression of the SHRNAs, therefore induce knockdown of a PCD protein. And we see robust regression of the tumor. And the tumor uh, soon become pretty much unmeasurable. And we keep the mice um, on doxycycline diet for a few, actually for half a year. And we, um, we, this uh, response is very durable. Within half a year, we do not see our 
the signs of regrowth of the tumor. And to make sure the effect is, we see it's, again, in vivo is, in due, is due to on target effects, we evaluated the, the so-called in vivo target engagement. Here we conducted a metabolomics uh, with the tumors uh, from the study. Um, these tumors were treated with the doxycycline for a week. Then um, we evaluated the, uh, the, how much metabolite it is there in this tumor. And we see robust accumulation of our 6 phosphogluconate, which is the substrate of PGD. So therefore, uh, we achieve in vivo target engagement um, as well here. So uh, we also uh, uh, delineated the mechanism of action of uh, the synthetic lethality between uh, PG PGD uh, inhibition and the FH loss of function mutation. So at a high level, um, it's through uh, multi-pronged effects, um, including uh, suppress suppression of glycolysis, which occurs actually in both FH Y type and FH mutated context, and also PGD inhibition impedes redox homeostasis and inhibits glutamine uh, reductive uh, carboxylation and the later two only occurs in the FH mutated context or the oxfos deficient context. So in the next three slides, I'm going to show you the data supporting the mechanism of action and that is uh, um, highlighted in the bullets here. First, we conducted uh, um, the LC mass spec metabolomics um, um, analysis. Um, both, we, we did both the steady state metabolomics and also uh, did the uh, uh, C13 uh, labeled isotope tracing uh, to conduct a flux analysis. So the, the, the cartoon on the left shows uh, the metabolites that are either accumulated or depleted with the PGD inhibition and also uh, the changes in flux with the PGD inhibition. What is pretty clear is we have a reduced lactate with the PGD inhibition, so PGD inhibition does suppress glycolysis. What is pretty interesting is uh, we only see um, decreased uh, glycolysis metabolites um, that is more downstream, but the upstream metabolites like glucose 6-phosphate, fractose 6-phosphate, these are actually uh, increased. So we see a breakage between uh, uh, um, um, PFK and the exact mechanism how 6-PGD inhibition suppresses um, the PFK steps that still requires a further investigation. And on the uh, PPP side, uh, PGD inhibition reduces the flux into uh, both the oxidative arm and the non-oxidative arm of the pentose phosphate pathway. So this is actually a mechanism that is um, similar in both FH mutated and FH uh, uh, Y type context. So, um, then the next is uh, a PGD inhibition um, because um, because of PGD's role in uh, NADPH production, we asked, does that have an impact in redox homeostasis? Um, here we show genetic inhibition of uh, um, a PGD causes a robust re induction of ROS. Uh, this is an uh, extremely uh, reproducible um, in robust increase at ROS. And, going, and since we see this data, we have been using these cells as a positive control for our uh, ROS experiments. Uh, then, um, in addition to genetic inhibition of PGD, also we use a uh, 6 amino nicotinamide, which is a, a chemical probe that inhibits uh, PGD. And we see, as short as the overnight treatment with a 6 amino nicotinamide, um, we also see a robust induction of ROS in the URK262 cells. And such induction of ROS is critical for the anti-proliferative phenotype of PGD inhibition uh, because uh, when we use the glutathione to reduce ROS, um, we also see a reduced cell proliferation um, under the treatment of 6 amino nicotinamide. So this mechanism actually only occurs in the uh, FH mutated context. So that is an uh, explanation of the synthetic lethality between PGD inhibition and FH loss of function mutation. So the third mechanism is, um, in, um, is a PGD's impact on reductive carboxylation of glutamine. So a few years ago, uh, some uh, uh, seminal work by Raph de Brandinis and, F and a few others, they show in the FH um, um, deficient cells, 
So the cells are actually no longer um, are relying on glucose to produce citrate and acetyl-CoA for lipid synthesis because the TCS cycle is uh, broken. So in, with the intact TCS cycle, the TCS cycle would run clockwise. And in, a, in the FH deficient cells, the cells would rely on glutamine um, to feed the TCS cycle. Then the TCS cycle would run in uh, the fashion that is uh, anti-clockwise. Basically, glutamine enters TCS cycle, becomes upper ketoglutarate, then generates citrate to um, feed uh, the fatty acid synthesis. So uh, this, um, this is so-called uh, reductive carboxylation of the glutamine, and this mechanism can actually be measured uh, using the stable isotope tracing uh, uh, using uh, the LC mass spec mass spec. So here uh, we use a C13 uh, uh, labeled glutamine to feed the cells and examine where the glutamine goes. Uh, in the bottom, in the URK262 cells, uh, we were able to detect a clear portion of the uh, M plus 5. Uh, citrate. So these are uh, the citrate from glutamine through reductive carboxylation. And with the PGD inhibition, you can see a clear reduction of the M plus 5 citrate, suggest, suggesting reduction of uh, uh, reductive um, uh, carboxylation of the glutamine. And on the right, on the, in the S H1650, which is a FH white type cell line, we don't see a major portion of reductive carboxylation. A carboxylation and the PGD inhibition does not suppress the M plus 5 citrate here. So these data suggest PGD inhibition also uh, has a significant impact on reductive carboxylation of the glutamine in the FH mutated cell. So to summarize, the first part of my talk, uh, through functional genomics approach, we identified a synthetic lethal interaction between PTD inhibition and, and, and the OXFOS deficiency. And the thorough in vitro and in vivo target validation work has validated the PTD as a target in FH mutated cancer. Um, and we have also uh, delineated such uh, multi pronged mechanism of action of PTD here. So these data would suggest we can target a PGD in FH mutated cancer. So since the synthetic lethal interaction is a two-way, um, um, we also asked, can we do the other way around? Can we target an FH or OXFOS in PGD deficient cancer? As you may know, we have our OXFOS inhibitor uh, that is actually under uh, clinical trials. This is the IX10759. So this is a complex one inhibitor um, of the uh, um, um, of oxidative phosphorylation. Um, it has a no, low nanomolar activity and cell-based functional assays. So this is a very potent and a specific compound. It is suitable for in vivo using. It has good for, uh, pharmaco uh, uh, kinetic properties to enable daily oral dosing. And we see dose-dependent efficacy uh, with a, a pharmacodynamics readout in relevant preclinical models. And there are two uh, phase one clinical trials that are actually ongoing with IX10759. One is a, a leukemia trial, and the other is a solid tumor trial. So um, some highlights of uh, IX10759, uh, it targets uh, complex one. Basically, uh, complex one um, generates an, an NAD, NAD, converts NAD to NAD plus. Um, uh, because this is coupled to oxygen consumption at the later stage of the electron transport chain. That's why suppressing uh, complex one would suppress oxygen consumption. So we have uh, gen uh, used a seahorse uh, with, uh, with our non small cell lung cancer H460 cell lines. And here we show uh, the real-time injection of IX10759 to the cells will be able to potently suppress oxygen consumption. We know uh, the mechanism of action of the compound is indeed due to complex one because uh, we have generated a, a acquired resistant um, models, a clone uh, towards IX10759. And a resistant mechanism is actually a mutation on uh, the, uh, 
a, a complex one. This clone called ND1. So mutation in ND1 uh, will make the cells resistant to IX10759. And importantly, our collaborator, uh, Judy Hurst from UK, uh, who has solved the, the complex one structure. So she also uh, shows um, the, dir the direct binding between IX10759 with complex one. So we know where exactly uh, 10759 binds to uh, the complex one, um, which is a very sol solid evidence for the mechanism of action of the compound. Oh, how do we uh, uh, utilize the synthetic lethal injections uh, in uh, position IX10759 in the clinic? So there are actually uh, two potential opportunities. Um, one is uh, um, the PGD homozygous deletion, and the, um, the other is called ENO1 homozygous deletion. So uh, PGD, I mentioned earlier, um, PGD inhibition suppresses the glycolysis, so that makes sense. And ENO1 is um, actually a glycolysis enzyme. Um, so this is at the uh, later stage of glycolysis, which is a few, just a few steps upstream of uh, a lact uh, no, a lactate dehydrogenase. So um, because uh, an oxfos inhibitor targets oxfos, um, then on the glycolysis deficient context, we think uh, uh, targeting oxfos uh, will have a better therapeutic uh, index, will have less metabolic uh, bypass and adaptation over there. So first, um, in, uh, again, this is the seahorse data you saw previously. Uh, I want to highlight the green bar, the MB1 cells. Uh, this is the glycolysis deficient, and this is actually a PGD homozygous deleted enzyme. And when we uh, overexpress a PGD uh, in uh, the MB1 cells, we are able to restore glycolysis. You will see increased lactate secretion to the cells. We also see an increased uh, ECAR measured by the seahorse assay. And this is our, um, indeed due to the enzymatic function of PGD, because when we overexpress the uh, two enzymatic dead mutants of PGD, we no longer uh, see such re rescue of glycolysis. So, um, and we tested how does oxalate inhibitor IX10759 work in PGD homozygous deleted MB1 cells. Uh, in the MB1 cells, we see a robust single agent activity in vitro. Um, and and um, in, importantly, when we uh, rest, uh, reintroduce PGD to the MB1 cells, we see a rescue of the uh, anti proliferative effect. Um, and we also did a proptosis analysis showing in MB1 cells that 10759 treatment actually causes a very robust ap apoptosis. So very robust single agent effect in vitro. And in vivo, um, we again, we waited until the tumors are of decent volume. These are very well established tumor by this stage. And our uh, treatment with IX10759 once per day, uh, an oral dosing causes robust regression of the tumor. This treatment is well tolerated, um, no body weight loss at the doses tested here. So we also confirmed the uh, in vivo uh, target engagement um, PGD inhibition, uh, sorry, <laughs> 10759 inhibition um, that are, um, because of it suppresses oxygen consumption. Uh, when, therefore, the tumor cells are no longer consuming oxygen and, and, and that releases uh, hypoxia. So here, the, uh, the immunohistochemistry data shows uh, 10759 treatment uh, eliminates hypoxia in the tumor cells. Uh, this is also an important uh, a secondary mechanism of action of IX10759. Oh, um, so far I've only shown you one model of our uh, PCD homozygous uh, deletion. Uh, we also use uh, SHRNA um, to generate um, our a second model with the PCD deletion uh, uh, in an OXFOS proficient model. So this is a H1975 not small cell lung cancer model. In vitro, we see a very nice synergistic effect between SHPCD and IX10759. And in vivo, uh, in H1975 cells with the docs inducible SHPGD, PGD inhibition single agent actually does not have very much effect in vivo in the OXFOS proficient model. 
And the 10759, um, it has some response, which is the red line you can see on the right. Um, it, it, it definitely suppresses tumor growth. However, the model progresses on treatment. And so the combination of um, PTD inhibition and the 10759 is able to cause robust tumor regression. So in a second model with a reduced level of PC, we're able to see a robust response of IX10759. So uh, this is uh, the PCD homozygous deleted population. And um, the ENO1 homozygous deleted population is a second potential synthetic lethal opportunity with IX10759. So this was uh, uh, occurs more often in the uh, glioblastoma cell line. This context was uh, identified by uh, Flory Mura and Ron DiPino uh, through uh, their seminal work in, uh, in a collateral lethality analysis. So uh, using uh, two ENO1 homozygous deleted uh, glioblastoma cell lines, so one is D423 and the other is G56. Uh, we see a uh, robust single agent activity in vitro from IX10759. And importantly, when we overexpress you know, one in these models, we see uh, much less uh, anti proliferative response from OXFOS inhibitor. And in these two models, we also see a robust apoptosis uh, by treatment um, using IX10759. And in vivo, uh, we utilized an isotopic uh, uh, model. This is the intracranial GBM model developed by uh, uh, the, Fred, the Fred Lungs Group at MD Anderson Cancer Center. So basically, uh, the mice, um, we made a boat, uh, we, we, made a, we boated the mice on their brain, then implanted the, um, the, the you know, one homozygous deleted cell lines uh, into the mouse brain. Once the tumors are well established, uh, confirmed by pretreatment uh, and MRI, then the mice were enrolled into a daily oral dosing with IX10759. These mice were dosed for four weeks. Then we conducted a, a, a post-dosing MRI to look at how the tumors looked like after uh, four weeks of dosing. And after that, we monitor the overall survival of the mice. So uh, you can appreciate in the MRNA images here is uh, uh, the vehicle uh, treated uh, mice, the tumors continue to grow on the four weeks period. Um, and the 10.59 uh, treated groups, we have reduced tumor volume. And we have uh, quantified the tumor volume um, showing uh, regression uh, by single agent treatment of IX10.59. And importantly, this treatment also extends the overall survival of the mice. So this is uh, uh, the uh, efficacy response in the mice. And we also conducted uh, the uh, companion uh, pharmacodynamics analysis. I mentioned to you earlier, 10.59 treatment would reduce hypoxia. Um, this is our, the tumor PD biomarker we used in our preclinical studies. And 10.59 uh, and here um, show inside the brain on the intracranial model also uh, reduces uh, uh, the hypoxia, suggesting on target activity of the compound. So um, then uh, how can we translate uh, such robust preclinical data targeting synthetic lethality to the actual patients? Uh, the, a, a key challenge here is uh, um, where is the patient population? Uh, we did some uh, uh, work trying to identify the PGD homozygous patient population and the ENO1 homozygous patient population. The PGD homozygous deleted population, um, it is rare. Uh, we're still work, uh, trying to find out and how, what is the physical way uh, to identify that patient population. And to this end, uh, we are at least able to identify the ENO1 homozygous deleted population. By collaborating with uh, uh, Dr. With Stuber's group at MD Anderson, uh, we analyzed uh, a panel of uh, GBM uh, human uh, tumor samples by screening through a total of uh, 92 
uh, GBM uh, uh, tumor samples, we are able to identify at least uh, three tumors that have been determined to be uh, ENO1 homozygous deleted. What you can see on the IHC images here, ENO1 is specifically deleted in the tumor cells, but they are still present on the stroma of these human beings. So we went further to develop uh, to develop a clear certified in you know, one IHC assay. So this assay is actually uh, being used to uh, screen any raw uh, substrates or in you know, one uh, homozygous deleted in the tumor for our uh, clinical trial. Um, this trial um, is not, uh, in addition to uh, glioblastoma, we also are able to identify in you know, one uh, homozygous deleted tumor for chondrial carcinoma. Uh, so these are the two indications. Um, uh, the clinical trial is searching for you know uh, you know one and, and, and homozygous deleted subjects. So um, to summarize the second part of my talk, an, an Oxfos complex one inhibitor IX10759 has robust single agent activity in glycolysis deficient tumor that are featured by homozygous deletion of either PGD or ENO1. And ENO1 uh, population can uh, be identified in our GBM and the chondrial uh, carcinoma using a clear certified IHVSA. And these are pretty rare patient populations, but I, we think uh, this is the area that um, the impact can be made. And the ongoing IX10759 solid tumor trial is actually actively screening and recruiting subjects with ENO1 uh, homozygous deletion in the tumor. So last but not least, I want to share with you some of the unpublished work um, on developing uh, seahorse assay to support the phase one clinical trial of IX10759. Um, since 10759 suppresses uh, oxygen consumption, we have shown you uh, data using the seahorse assay on cell lines. And can we use this on uh, in vivo samples, on AML PDX models, and potentially on human uh, AML blood as well? Uh, so we have uh, this is the layout of the assay. We take um, um, the, the human blood or ML PDX samples through FICO isolation. We reached um, the the cancer cells. Then through uh, CD3 and CD19 depletion, we got um, the viable uh, cancer cells. Then plated it on, on seahorse plate using uh, uh, the using uh, the cell tech coating. So uh, using uh, the PDX models, um, first uh, the efficacy data with the ML PDX model, IX10759 dose dependently suppresses, extends the overall survival of the mice, as low well as uh, one nick per cake, once per day oral dosing, and also at 2.5 nick per, 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 per cake per day, and also 7.5 uh, uh, nick per cake. So uh, utilizing these dose on PD assays, Using the the seahorse um, an assay on ML PDX model, um, ex vivo, we are able to achieve dose dependent suppression of uh, maximal OR um, by IX10759, and we tested uh, four different uh, PDX models using ex vivo seahorse assay. So uh, we further uh, tested with our primary human AML samples, uh, taking human um, AML blood. The samples were isolated, enriched with uh, cancer cells. Then we conducted ex vivo treatment with IX10759 for four hours, then plated them on the seahorse plate. And here uh, we show ex vivo spiking of 10759 is able to potently reduce OCAR with the human AML samples in a dose dependent manner. As low as 10 nanomolar of compound, we're able to suppress OCAR about 50%. So um, we also uh, further uh, validated uh, um, the assay for clinical use um, in, in a research setting. We, um, we, we evaluated the, uh, the reproducibility and the variability of the assay by looking at a few human sub subjects. We see a very little uh, intra-subject variability, and very uh, we see some intra-subject variability that's likely caused by the particular treatment. These are human scars. 
Um, so because of the robust preclinical data, we developed the assay to support the phase one clinical trial. Um, in the end, um, on a seahorse plate, a 96-12 seahorse plate, both um, the, um, the human and male samples isolated from um, human blood uh, were seeded at 400K cells per well. Um, we included uh, some positive control in the cells, which is the uh, OCR-ML3, which is this is a leukemia cell line. She also makes sure um, the, uh, the, the, the OCA observed is in range. In every single seahorse plate we run, we build in uh, this uh, linear, uh, li linearity seeding control using the uh, OCR ML3 cell lines. So the cells are seeded at 400K, 300K, 200K, and 100K um, uh, per well. So we want to make sure uh, the um, OCA detected with the human and male samples that is in range of uh, the serial dilution of OCR ML3 cells. So this assay is, uh, has been implemented, uh, implemented uh, in our phase one clinical trial. So this is uh, the trial, phase one trial, uh, study of 10759 uh, in subjects with a relapsed or refractory and acute um, myeloid leukemia. So the, um, um, the exploratory uh, goal of uh, this trial is a pharma pharmacodynamic biomarker of activity, and one of the ph pharmacodynamic biomarker is the seahorse assay. So a, a peripheral blood uh, is harvested the pre and post dosing with IX10759. Um, so I, I, my last data slide, I want to uh, show you some uh, preliminary data uh, from the trial. Um, so the, the, the human subject were enrolled into the trial. We got a pre-dose uh, blood. Uh, then we also get a, pre, a, a post a, a post dosing blood six hours after dosing. Then after a one week washout period um, of the compound to let the compound completely get out of the system, and then the subjects entered into once a day oral dosing. Then again we have a pre and post blood harvested throughout the dosing period. First um, we analyzed the human PK of IX1079. 10.759 from the one mic per cake uh, cohort. Uh, the PK data here shows uh, um, from three different uh, subjects um, dosed at the same level. You see very uh, less um, subject to subject variation in PK, and this compound has good uh, bio uh, bioavailability in humans. And uh, and the, the uh, the OCAR analysis, the seahorse analysis um, with the blasts isolated from subjects from the trial also shows um, pre and post dose OCAR levels. The, uh, the red dot here is um, the blood taken six hours post dosing of IX10759, and the Black dots is the matching pre-dosing blood, and clearly we can see uh, some reduction of OCAR uh, from uh, from uh, samples from the clinical trial. So um, with that, I um, would like to uh, acknowledge uh, and my department, the MD Anderson Therapeutic uh, Discovery Division. Um, so, uh, particularly um, the Oxfos team, it takes uh, uh, a village to get this kind of work, this kind of work down. Uh, Joe Maslach is the project lead of uh, IX10759 um, program, the biology lead, and uh, Amelia uh, uh, is the chemistry lead of the program. And Marina uh, runs the you know, phase one clinical trial for the for the of the leukemia trial, and Team Yap uh, runs the solid uh, uh, trial with IX10759. And I want to also acknowledge uh, Jennifer Moliner, who, uh, uh, who leads the uh, Oxfos um, ML work uh, in, the, um, for the, in the preclinical setting. Um, so I would also like to acknowledge um, MD Anderson, um, and, um, the, the Therapeutics Discovery Division leadership, uh, Phil Jones, Tim Heffernan, and uh, Julio Dreta, and our collaborators, the Forum, Mira, uh, Ignacio Westuva, and uh, uh, Ron DiPino, and a few others which I don't get to mention throughout this presentation. And with that, I would like to again uh, uh, thank uh, the opportunity to present at this forum, and thank you so much for joining me today. And I'm happy to take your questions. 
Thanks, Yu Ting. That was a very interesting presentation. Um, we got to hear a lot of good stories. And uh, we do have uh, several questions. So we'll go ahead and get started with the Q&A portion of the webinar. Um, some of you have already chatted in questions, but if you have a question that you'd like to ask, um, feel free to submit it. Um, and we'll either get to those questions uh, before the end of the hour, and we have about 10 minutes left. Um, and if not, we'll, um, we'll follow up with you by email to answer uh, the questions that we aren't able to get to. So um, we'll go ahead and get started. And the first question um, is about the compound um, a little bit. Um, the mm -hmm. around Some questions around the specificity of uh, this compound for cancer cells compared to non-cancer cells, and then related, um, you know, related to that, is does it have properties that um, is it better, more specific than other ox, uh, complex one inhibitors? Does it make a better candidate for treatment than other ox, uh, complex one inhibitors? Yeah. So I think uh, there are actually a couple of questions embedded here. So the first question is um, about the specificity of uh, this compound and how is that compared with uh, other oxfos inhibitor. This is uh, a highly specific and potent uh, oxfos complex one inhibitor, and um, it, it is uh, it works in that nanomolar range. Um, here, I'm, I guess, um, when I'm asked comparing with other oxalate inhibitors, people are talking about potentially like metformin, symphomin. Um, and, and metformin, symphomin works at micromolar range, and this compound works in nanomolar range. Um, and we have uh, uh, fully delineated the mechanism action of this compound by uh, identifying resistant mutations uh, towards this compound. A uh, single point mutation in ND1 in the complex one were able to uh, render resistance towards IX10759. So this clearly suggests uh, the, the on-target specific activity of the compound. And this, I think I heard the other question is uh, the action of this compound in cancer cells versus uh, normal cells. Uh, in terms of uh, oxygen consumption, it does not do anything different between cancer and normal cells. It will suppress oxygen consumption no matter what. Um, although um, very often we see cancer cells have a probably high level of oxygen consumption than normal cells, uh, just the base level. Um, then uh, um, what um, give us the therapeutic index is the uh, specific metabolic vulnerability um, in cancer cells, uh, how the cancer cells become more dependent on ox cells. I mean, there are a lot of evidence in the literature suggests uh, providing uh, you know, rationale of uh, targeting ox cells, including targeting cancer stem cells, targeting acquired drug resistance. So the two contexts I presented here, these are uh, glycolysis deficient contexts. So because these cancer cells are already deficient in glycolysis, they become solely rely on ox cells for, um, for a lot of things. That's why we think uh, they will have uh, uh, a great therapeutic in index there. Okay, thanks so much, Yu Ting. Um, a technical question um, about the the um, in vitro studies. Um, are you modulating the concentration of the glucose in your media at all, or uh, I guess you can tell just if you can share with us the substrate concentration? Um. So. So we run the seahorse assay in a few different settings, including a uh, like preclinical setting and uh, um, you know the supporting the clinical trial, supporting the phase one trial. So um, in the preclinical uh, 
basic research experiments, the glucose concentration, uh, we have used a range of concentrations, but um, it appears does not matter. Uh, we will always see suppression of uh, oxygen consumption by X10759, uh, no matter how much glucose we use. Um, then for the supporting the the clinical trial, so we further optimize the assay. We tend to use the so-called physiological uh, relevant concentration of uh, glucose. And I, I, I don't remember the exact glucose concentration on top of my brain, but I believe this is um, also mentioned in the Nature Medicine paper that came out in 2018. And I'm happy you know, to um, uh, provide the concentrate the amount of glucose we use by email as well. Okay, thank you. Um, the oh, we have another technical question, um, and this has to do with the FCCP. So it looked like you were primarily running the cell mitostress test, and the question is for testing the human primary cells. Do you need to optimize the FCCP concentration for each individual? Or are you stand, have you standardized on one FCC concentration for all of the patient samples? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, I initially had a slide like that, but then I took that out. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so definitely even what, uh, I'm sure this question is from someone who knows this assay really well. Um, um, even with the cell lines, um, we have we always have to optimize the FCCP concentration. So what we do is, um, well, the short answer is we do have to optimize FCCP concentration for you know, for for different subjects. So, um, well, I let me take to this slide. So in this slide, you can see there is a like first part of the trial. There is a screen stage. So that means uh, at this at this screen stage, we actually get some blood from this particular subject, and we run that through the seahorse assay. We do a dose titration of FCCP uh, in a range that is recommended by Agilent. Then, based on that, we will pick a concentration, one or two FCCP concentration that we're actually going to use when we later on actually run uh, samples from this particular subject. So that, yes, needs to be uh, determined uh, from subject to subject. There is a small range of variability with that as well. Okay. And so then once you've determined a dose for a given subject, then you keep that dose consistent throughout the, time, uh, the course of the trial, right? So you're six weeks later, or day yeah. 28 later, you're using the same FCCP as you did on day zero, right? Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Um, sorry, hold on. I'm going to look at the um, more of these. these Um, there was a question about solubility of the uh, compound, but I also heard you mention that you know it has good bioavailability. So maybe you can tell us about how, like, how you manage the solubility in vitro and as well as for in vivo. Um, the compound is uh, I, it's a. Uh, it has very good oral bioavailability. We have always been using that through oral dosing. So when we uh, in vivo dose the animals, we use the 0.5% uh, methylcellulose uh, as the formulation. So that is not a clear solution. It is a suspension. The compound has to be our uh, vortexed uh, in methylcellulose and also sonicated to help the compound to uh, get into uh, the the, the, dose, the dosing solution, the formulation. But once it is there, um, it is uh, stable. And for, um, well, for we, 
we, we remake the in vivo dosing solution once per week, and uh, during that week, uh, when we are not using the compound, we keep that on a, on a storing plate, on constant just uh, storing, so that makes sure uh, no compound crashes out of uh, the formulation. Uh, so this works very consistently. And for in vitro use, we don't have our, um, very much issue uh, with, with the compound solubility as long as we use it under one micromolar um, in, in, in media. So if we go over, uh, say, one micromolar or over three micromolar in media, uh, we will occasionally notice a compound crashing out of uh, the media. So regardless, this is a highly potent compound. We, we mostly uh, use this compound in like 10 nanomolar. Uh, if we want to hit it really hard, uh, as uh, we use 100 nanomolar in vitro, so we don't have to go to that high concentration. Great, so because it is so potent, it's plenty soluble at the effective doses. That's that's really great. Um, so I guess uh, we're we're at the top of the hour. So um, I'd like to thank Yu Ting for the um, fantastic presentation and great answers to our questions. And I think it's just um, it's a really nice story of how. Um, Modulating metabolism can impact um, uh, tumor proliferation, as well as knowing what your, the metabolic phenotype of the cancer you're trying to target is will really define the therapeutic approach that you want to take um, for a given class of cancer, different, or given you know, genetic mutation. So your work really showed uh, nicely that how you know for a very give, a given set of phenotypes that this type of approach is um, is very powerful. So thanks so much, Dr. Sun, and um, talk to you all next time. Thank you so much, Sarah, and thank you so much, everyone, for spending the time with me. I appreciate that.